Hi, this is Kaisa again. In today's lecture, we take a deep dive into connectivity. In this first part, I introduce a multi-level framework for defining connectivity. Such an approach is needed because it really makes a difference whether we speak about habitat, landscape or ecological connectivity. Once we get our mindset with the definitions of connectivity, I describe several ways to measure connectivity. These connectivity calculations mostly apply to habitat connectivity and they utilize either a landscape, structural or a population, ecological, more functional approach. Connectivity is another multidimensional and often vaguely defined concept at the heart of landscape ecology and spatial conservation planning. Connectivity is basically a property of the landscape that is dependent on the amount and distribution of a focal pattern. Those patterns can be resources, habitats, ecological processes or functions. Due to spatial autocorrelation within and interactions among landscape elements, connectivity is always present in any landscape in some form. There are three main types of or conceptualizations of connectivity that landscape ecology deals with. These connectivity types are very different from each other. They operate at different spatial levels and they are defined from different perspectives. Landscape connectivity is the easiest to measure. Landscape connectivity refers to the degree to which a landscape facilitates or impedes movement of organisms among resource patches, often measured in terms of vegetation coverage patterns that are classified based on human interpretation. Habitat connectivity is the most meaningful connectivity type in a population perspective. Being opposite to habitat isolation, habitat connectivity describes the connectedness of suitable habitat patches for an individual species. This is an organism-centered definition of connectivity. Then we have ecological connectivity, which is defined through systemic linkages. It is the spatial connectedness of ecological processes across multiple scales including trophic relationships, disturbance regimes, long distance migration, hydroecological flows, climate impacts and so forth. You can think of connectivity as a dimension or scale with three levels. The scale of connectivity can be seen as ranging from habitat connectivity to landscape connectivity and the broadest category being ecological connectivity. The three connectivity levels are interrelated, meaning that there are cross-level interactions among them. For example, ecological connectivity likely promotes landscape connectivity and vice versa. Think about the boreal taiga. It is a wide forested landscape that provides habitat for a variety of species, and at the same time the taiga forest functions as an important global storage for carbon, while releasing oxygen to the atmosphere that surrounds the whole biosphere. Ecological and landscape connectivities in turn have effects on habitat connectivity. However, the habitat level effects depend on the species in question. The question here is, how is the focal species able to use the whole landscape? For example, many pollinator insects have colonies located in species-rich meadows. How are the pollinators able to spread out to forests on surrounding fields and conduct the pollination service of crop plants? Connectivity is a phenomenon that is extremely important in land use planning. In the human realm, connectivity is apparent in many societal infrastructures. Think about road networks and other types of transport, housing areas, business centers within cities, locations of malls and grocery stores, schools and health services. 
Their locations are planned with connectivity in mind in order to make them reachable for people and various resources. In land use planning in general and conservation planning in particular, the usual approach is to work with either habitat connectivity or landscape connectivity, as their spatial dimension is manageable when compared to ecological connectivity. In order to include connectivity measures into a quantitative analysis, such as a zonation prioritization, connectivity needs to be expressed in numbers. There are many ways to measure or quantify connectivity, the easiest of which are the structural connectivity indices. Structural connectivity refers to the contiguity of patches belonging to a same class, thus it measures the physical composition and configuration of a landscape. Structural connectivity metrics are quite straightforward to measure. Structural connectivity metrics include nearest neighbor distances, aggregation measures, subdivision measures such as mean patch size, and isolation measures. Metrics of structural connectivity are often used to measure landscape connectivity, but they can be applied to habitat connectivity as well if a robust index of habitat connectivity is appropriate. If, however, we need a more fine-tuned measure of habitat connectivity, we need to use a functional connectivity index. Functional connectivity reflects behavioral responses of an organism to landscape elements. Functional connectivity is an ecological term and it is always defined through species-specific traits. Functional connectivity includes, for example, spotting the locations of territories or breeding grounds, migratory routes or sink and source populations, and the dispersal of individuals in between. Functional connectivity relates to habitat connectivity, but it can be used to measure ecological connectivity as well. Think about the salmon migrating from Pacific Ocean to Alaskan rivers for breeding. After spawning, these fish die and provide an important food source for terrestrial animals. As a result, the Pacific salmon migration forms a large-scale nutrient flow from the oceanic ecosystem to the terrestrial ecosystem, thus linking the two not only through movement of the fish, but also on the level of abiotic ecosystem functioning. Thus, the same calculation principles can be applied to ecological connectivity as well. Calculation of functional connectivity requires additional parameterization. Let's examine our simple example landscape again. If we wish to calculate the functional connectivity of the blue habitat, we need to know how this focal habitat patch and the species population within it is connected to other similar patches within a large landscape. Now we focus on the blue habitat and treat all other colors as matrix. Matrix often is defined to be hostile for the species living in the blue habitat. Thus, we assume that individuals who disperse to matrix have increased mortality and decreased fecundity. How large the probability of dying and not producing offspring is within the matrix when compared to staying within the habitat belongs to the parameterization of functional connectivity. Additional important species-specific parameters are related to the ability of the habitat to host individuals. So, we get back to our old friends, habitat area, quality and aggregation. That is, we need to know at least what kinds of relationships there are between the population size of our target species and the amount and quality of its habitat. More elaborate calculations of functional connectivity also include parameterization of the relationship between population size and habitat aggregation or density. All this information then needs to be put into a single quantitative measure. There is a huge number of mathematical formulas that aim to grasp the essence of functional connectivity or its inverse, which is functional isolation. 
The measures I will list here have been used by various researchers in relation to their specific research questions and needed level of detail in defining functional connectivity. And they can be calculated either using distances between patch centers or patch edges. The basic metric, a very simple one, is mean nearest neighbor measure calculated as an average distance to the nearest population that is patch of the same kind over all patches in the landscape. Another easily understandable and very simple functional connectivity measure is calculated as the combined amount of habitat within a given buffer. Nearest neighbor distances and buffer measures actually are just applied metrics of structural connectivity. They lack these population ecological details. Nearest neighbor distances and buffer measures build on the idea of just ignoring the unoccupied patches in the landscape from the focal species perspective. The calculations are based on the distances between the populations or occupied habitat patches and the size of occupied patches, nothing else. Incidence functions provide a more elaborate method of measuring functional connectivity. Incidence functions truly attempt to measure habitat connectivity instead of landscape connectivity. They include calculations of connectedness of each habitat patch in the landscape in relation to other patches and thus take into account distances to all possible source populations of the vocal species. In incidence functions, the effect of distance to migration probability is included with so-called negative exponential dispersal kernels. So what does this negative exponential dispersal kernel do? It defines the effect of distance on the probability of dispersal as a continuous and nonlinear metric. Here it differs greatly from buffer measures that define a radius or threshold beyond which dispersal is assumed inexistent, like this. Dispersal distance by default is a key parameter in calculating functional connectivity. A buffer measure where a single value determines whether a species is capable of moving between patches or not beyond a certain distance represents a stark oversimplification of the way species utilize the landscape. In incidence functions, the effect of dispersal is treated in a more nuanced and realistic way. There are no threshold distances to start with. Dispersal is translated into immigration probability and thus contributes to population size and longevity. If we are studying a mobile species, it likely has quite long migration distances. Some individuals can travel extremely long distances, although most individuals remain relatively close to their source populations. The dispersal ability of such species is rather high. A more sedentary species has shorter migration distances and a lower dispersal ability. In incidence functions, the parameter alpha scales the effect of distance to migration. It is calculated based on the average migration distance of the focal species. In incidence functions, mobile species have lower alpha values and less mobile species have higher alpha values. This information on the continuous and nonlinear effect of distance on the probability of dispersal is included in the incidence functions for habitat connectivity and the calculations are done for each habitat patch or population or grid cell in the landscape, considering all other locations of the same type within the whole landscape. In both of these functions, the connectivity effect declines by distance in an ecologically reasonable manner. Incidence functions also have strong empirical support. Using spatial data on species occurrences, it is possible to calculate the connectivity values for the populations of that species over the landscape and produce a so-called distribution smooth connectivity surface. <laughs> 
Such connectivity surfaces suit well spatial prioritization analysis and have been used in many zonation analyses to include information on species occurrence probabilities. Also, habitat distributions can be used as surrogates for specialist species data if actual observation data on species occurrences is not available. In an earlier lecture, we got familiar with the concept of fragmentation and the way it is tied to habitat loss. The disappearance of habitat leads to decreased connectivity as there is less habitat available for a focal species within the landscape. However, also the spatial arrangement of habitat feeds into connectivity. If all habitat is located in one patch, the internal connectivity of that patch is high. If habitat loss and fragmentation occur together, which often is the case, connectivity decreases with quite drastically as there are smaller patches with longer distances in between. Yet, it is important to understand that fragmentation per se and connectivity are not opposite to each other. Actually, habitat fragmentation defined as breaking apart of habitat can easily increase habitat connectivity as shown here in the figure. In a fragmented landscape where habitat is abundant, species readily do move across short distances of matrix between the habitat patches. Thus, the assumption of the hostile matrix is another oversimplification often done by researchers who study habitat connectivity. The important thing to remember is that it is more correct to think of habitat isolation as the opposite of habitat connectivity. This is also mathematically applicable, as most connectivity indices can be transformed into isolation indices directly by negating them. Okay, there was quite a handful of theoretical approaches to conceptualize and calculate connectivity. Connectivity is such an important phenomenon in ecology, and there are various ways to study connectivity in practice. Empirical approaches include movement observations, such as mark recapture studies and radio tracking. Also, functional distances among landscape elements can be studied based on organisms' movement intensities and mortality rates in relation to the studied landscape elements. An alternative research methodology uses modeling of connectivity in terms of dispersal success simulations search time computations, and least cost path analysis. The benefit of modeling studies is that they are quite cost efficient to conduct, and especially for gaining information on threatened species behavior, modeling often offers an ethically reasoned research approach. However, modeling studies typically have multiple restrictions in how the results can be interpreted and applied this is because they lack the ecological context of empirical in-field studies. Both empirical and modeling-based connectivity studies utilize index calculations to measure connectivity. Researchers tend to choose that connectivity measure that best suits their research interest and assumptions of the nature on connectivity. Thank you for viewing this video and we shall continue with the topic of connectivity in part two of this lecture.